I think trust is kind of a big part of the system. Like you need to have deep trust in a remote first environment. We don't really track anything. We don't track how many hours they work. We don't track when they work, where they work. You know, we really care about, you know, their output, what they are actually delivering. Is that a great quality? Hey, bootstrappers. Welcome to Bootstrap Stories, the podcast where founders, marketers, and thoughtful leaders share the most actionable tips on building a successful business. After meeting with hundreds of bootstrappers in the past years, I figured out that we all struggle to grow our businesses. But the truth is that most of us don't know where to ask for help or advice. That's why I decided to start this podcast, to give you all the keys to succeed at every stage of your business, all the tested strategies for solving your struggles and taking your business to a new level. No fluff, no bullshit, only a real talk between friends that help each other succeed. Today, my guest for this episode is Amir Salihefendik, the CEO of Doist. Amir, welcome to Bootstrap Stories. Thank you, G, for having me here. I'm looking forward for this, yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited. I know you're a bit jet-lagged coming back from Chile to Barcelona. Um, and I'm quite curious to know a bit more about you know, like your story at Doist. So for those who don't know what Doist does, can you give us a bit of an overview from uh, what the company does and also like when you started and uh, how big you are right now. Sure. So, um, you know, uh, I have been running this for over a decade now. Like I started in 2007 as a side project. And, you know, so it's like 13, 14 years now wow. running. Uh, so it's a long time. And uh, yeah, so we are about like 100 people. We have also been like remote first since the beginning, like, uh, you know, for a decade, over a decade now. We have also been like some of the pioneers in the space. Uh, and uh, in terms of like, you know, size, like we are going to hit, I think like we are around like 20 million in ARR. Uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, and it's like all bootstrap. So, you know, no VCs. Ah, Fuck VCs. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was it a choice from the start, like uh, not to take any VC money or... Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have like this story, you know, first of all, like, I actually did start a VC backed social network. That was my first company. Okay. And I kind of like really got burned by that. Like, you know, like we grew crazy. Like we grew, I think like, I don't know, over 10 million people in six months. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, you know, social network, almost like exponential growth. Uh, but honestly, like everything was on fire. Like we didn't have a business model. So we were just like burning cash. Uh, and I was super inexperienced and honestly, like, yeah, like I kind of like, I was very close to like burnout there mm. and just like a very, uh, like toxic work environment because, you know, everything would be on fire. I would work all the time and I would have all kind of like stress and, and stuff. Uh, yeah. So I was kind of like very burned out by that model. And also like, you know, in 2007, like, I'm not sure if you remember the, yeah. the how it was, but like, you know, nobody really cared about a business model. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, this is kind of like nuts, you know? And then you also like really depended on the VCs and the milestones. On, mm. And, you know, like we grew in like Taiwan. Okay. Uh, so we actually had to raise like from like Chinese investors and like, I mean, it was just like a mess. So, you know, uh, and then also some of the early things as well, like uh, when Todays was growing in like 2008, uh, I think around that time, uh, I actually got an offer um, like a seed investment offer from like a very big Silicon Valley firm. And like one of the first things they wanted to do is like replace me as a CEO. Uh, <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just like, fuck this, you know, like, yeah, like I'm just like doing, doing this. I mean, so you, I think you've met with like the worst VC ever because I, I don't understand people who would invest in seed and said, okay, like let's replace the CEO. This is really dumb. <laughs> Yeah, but honestly, like that was kind of the 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 the, the tag uh, or like the the playbook back then. It was kind okay. of like you know, like because my specialty is like it's actually tech. Like I'm okay. a developer. Yeah, you were an engineer. So yeah. so so they kind of like look at this like yeah, he can't really run a company. Like we need a CEO here. And then honestly, like maybe it could have made sense, but uh, yeah, like it was just like for me, like you know, uh, this was my baby. You know, I didn't yeah. want anybody to go in and take control over it you know and like not as the first step like you know that was just not that's 
and and your strategy like because uh, obviously you're bootstrapped so to hire like so many people you are like profitable and uh, and at 20 like or hitting 20 million uh, in annual recurring revenue what was your strategy like to uh, build kind of like uh, a cash cow and then you know like enjoy the dividends as a founder and keep growing on other project or how exactly did you evolve over time when building the business Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, like I started like with this goal of having like 30k per month. Nice. Uh, that was kind of my goal uh, to have. Uh, but as I was kind of like getting close to that, I was just like, this isn't really, you know, what motivates me. You know, like I find this like very boring. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's when I started to hire people and scale and like have bigger ambitions of what I wanted to build. Uh, yeah, but you know. Initially, it was kind of like, okay, I want to have like, you know, just like a, you know, like this thing that generates money, you know, passive income was kind of like mm. a, a trend. Uh, but honestly, like, I found out quickly that like, you know, that was a very boring life like that, you know, I really, <laughs> like I'm quite ambitious, so, like I really want to be like pushed and, you know, like challenged in my work. I, you know, I don't, I don't really like like static aspects of just like having some um some passive income so you know that's something i quickly find out but like yeah i told my brother like you know this is kind of like that's actually the story is like how i'm connected to chile as well like i, I just really to chile is like i actually went to be part of like startup chile and it was okay. kind of like my goal is kind of to generate like this startup that generates some passive income but yeah That quickly like changed and it became much bigger than <laughs> than you expected uh, at first. Well, I think it's nice for me. It's uh, what I say is like ambition is like appetite. You know, like uh, the more you eat, the more you are hungry and you want to to get uh, to get ambitious. And and yeah, I agree. I I think it was exactly the same for us when we got started. My ambition was just to get a salary, and then afterwards, you know, like uh, it started growing. And um, you know, you you were mentioning that uh, that you are about like a hundred people. So I'm curious, you know, like uh, whenever you are scaling, do you put yourself objectives on the amount of people you want to hire, uh, on the revenue, or how exactly do you set, you know, like uh, all these goals at the beginning of the year uh, until the end? And um, do you put like hard stop on things or what's your mindset regarding like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, um, Like our story has been kind of like a wild, wild west because like we have actually never had like goals okay. uh, <laughs> or like revenue targets or whatever. Uh, so uh, this is kind of changing right now. Uh, this is changing right now because, you know, it's just like once you reach a scale, you actually like people want this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They want to have like some targets to hit like some direction and stuff like that. But initially, you know, like for the like first many years, like we were just like, we want to build cool products that people value and use. Uh, and like metrics, that's also not really something like we care that much about, like revenue goals, etc. I mean, the only thing, the the indicator was based like, is our you know bank account growing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then like uh, some of uh, like some, uh, like the way that we hire people is kind of like, uh, can we afford the person, you know, uh, what kind of budget do we have? And then we go out and hire a person. <laughs> so honestly, like, it was like super non-planned. This said, you know, as we have grown, especially like the recent years, like uh, especially actually the last year, we have become much more structured. And I think like you need to be uh, become structured at some point. But you know, you can also do it like we did it initially. But I would not really recommend it because like um, I think like operationalizing some of that uh, can probably. Uh, you know, you can build a much bigger business by doing that. We should probably have started that earlier. Yeah. And um, you you were mentioning like sometimes you hire people based on the, the amount of money you've got, obviously. And uh, my, my question is uh, right now, because you are in a phase where you're like really scaling with like big ambitious goals, how exactly do you uh, do like your cash flow management? Because I know it's, it's sometimes like very like uh, tricky for bootstrap founders. So you're at a stage where you obviously are profitable and have enough money, but do you give yourself a little bit of room and saying like, for example, okay, um, I'm not going to go under, let's say, 200K per month of profit or X amount of dollar each month of profit so I can hire on, on that end. Like how exactly do you do it? Or 
do you also have like the the same mindset as some you know like VC back companies where you put yourself in a non profitable states for a bit and expect with uh, the people you hire to grow fast enough so you can uh, you can compensate it. Yeah, I mean historically like, we have always been profitable and we actually built like a, a bank uh, like account that kind of had. Uh, some of our profits, you know, to kind of have like cushion. Ah, nice. Um, so that means like we can be a bit more risky and we can sometimes like say, okay, now we're actually going to be not profitable uh, okay. while like we invest into this. Nice. Uh, so that's something that we have done. Uh, and we have always also like played very conservatively in terms of like what kind of investment we do. So, you know, like uh, we are never uh, trying to, you know, put everything on the line. So, you know, you go in and like hire 100 people and then suddenly the stuff that you try to invest in does not work. And then suddenly you have a huge payroll. Yeah. Um, so honestly, we have always been on, on the conservative side and something as well. I think like something I've learned is really like, you know, uh, stay as small as possible. You know, uh, like uh, like people kind of this kind of like, I think, uh, vanity metric, uh, mm. you know, it's much more critical to kind of like, you know, look at like revenue per employee. Uh, I mean, you know, I think like fast. Uh, the company oh yeah, that's a crazy like a, story. It's a great example. Like they have 500 people, you know, 600K ARR. Like, you know, it's insane. Like, you know. It's insane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I prefer to even say as like a MRR. I prefer to say like 50K MRR <laughs> and 500 employees. It's like, yeah, crazy. Uh, yeah, and I think you have a lot of these companies as well. So honestly, like I think like uh, for us, like one of the node star metric is kind of like revenue per employee because that kind of tracks your productivity. Uh, and then as a bootstrap company, you really need to track that because you know, like <laughs> you don't just have like a, a, a you know a bank account you can burn. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's really interesting. And I think like yeah, like. For fast, I was so shocked by this story. Like for me, I, I thought I thought initially it was a typo, and the guy meant that it was like their MRR, and I would have been saying like, okay, like I mean, yeah, it's not as fast as other company, and you're definitely not profitable, but it's not that bad. And then the guy was like, oh, it's actually like the the, year, the real <laughs> annual recurring revenue. <laughs> no, crazy, crazy, crazy. And um, can you maybe like um, go through kind of like the the time frame at which you grow uh, Doist. So for example, like uh, how long did it take you to grow to like the first million, then from one to 10 and how big the team was, et cetera, when you hit the milestone? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good uh, question. I, 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 you know, I'm just like, I, I will pull this out of my head. Yeah. I'm actually sure if it's 100% <laughs> So it's true a or plus not. or minus. Uh... Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, something to know is like, uh, for the first four years, it was a side project for me. Like mm -hmm. I was actually working in a social network uh, yeah. that I mentioned. Uh, and I was just like working, hacking on this uh, during uh, my, uh, my free time. And honestly, like uh, I'm not sure like what the revenues were, but it was kind of like a few thousand dollars per month. It was like a super micro uh, project. Uh, yeah. And I, I actually never really thought it would become like a huge business, you know, like that wasn't really in like, uh, you know, because I was focused on some other stuff. Um, and at some point, like I did go in full-time mode. And the thing is like, uh, like during the social network, I learned a ton. And I just like, once I returned back full-time, like, you know, I was super productive. I yeah. really knew what I, was, what I was doing. So I created a lot of results. And that kind of made me, created a cushion of just like revenues. Like I was very fast to kind of reach like, I don't know, almost 30,000, like what, which was my goal. I think I reached that in like six months Wow. from nice. like where we're going uh, to. And then I just basically started to hire. So some of the first early people I hired was like a support person because I was just like super overwhelmed. And then I invested like in mobile developers. So, um, I, I and honestly, like, you know, some of these, many actually of the early hires that are hired, they're, they're still at the company. Really? Uh, wow. That's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of them, I'm actually unsure, like, you know, everybody's was insane, like, including me, because, like, I was kind of like, you know, uh, like, my pitch was basically, like, I can pay you very little, 
and I don't know like how for how long, <laughs> but we're like building cool shit. Like you should you should join this. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so like some of the early people did that, you know, and and I think like as a founder, it's also like super critical like, that you can actually convince people to join you, uh, because especially you know early on, like you can't pay. Uh, you know, I pay very low salaries, like because mm. I could not afford anything else. Like, uh, and then you kind of like need to, you know, sell the vision and like, uh, yeah, like get them on board and like get them invested into what you're doing. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm I'm also curious because you've been growing like your project Bootstrap. You always you mentioned that some of your early employees are still there. Um, something that I've seen personally is that. What I tend to do was people who joined early is give them like uh, responsibilities to like uh, as the company grow, help them grow also. So, for example, the first person like uh, in uh, in growth became head of growth by definition and started managing, etc. But after a few years, like I realized that sometimes, you know, like the skills did not match a specific position. And is that something that you faced? How exactly did you deal with, you know, like... Um, Sometimes people not being able to level up quick enough to match like the company ambition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is that something that uh, that you faced as an issue, or I think like any company faces this as an issue. You know, like I think it's a it's a real problem, and uh, like if you don't resolve it, it basically means you know you can have like some critical positions where you're not growing because you know like people are not you don't really have the right people you know on the right positions. Um, yeah, and, you know, like resolving this is also really, really complex because a lot of times you have really deep relationship, you know, uh, and like people have believed in this for a long time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's super, super tough to actually go into this. But, you know, the the, the way that I see this, and honestly, like I have also developed this, uh, all like my thinking <laughs> has evolved <laughs> since the beginning because like just being blindly loyal and, you know, the problem with that is like, it basically means that, you know, the company will die at mm. some point. Uh, like you must make hard decisions that are going to be hurtful, you know, uh, that are going to hurt um, because, you know, what your, what your objective is as a founder, as a CEO is kind of like, you know, build a great company that can employ great people and like, you know, grow. Uh, and you can't just protect like individuals. Uh, of course, like we are very people first, but you know, like uh, if you are just like sacrificing, you know, the whole for like individuals, then at some point you will just lose, you know, especially in the hugely competitive market that we are seeing right now. Uh, so that's something that makes it easier to like, make very hard decisions because you know you're really making decisions for the everybody in the company for future employees and you know with 100 people you have like 100 families that are dependent uh so there's like a lot of like you know uh dependencies so like you can't really have somebody that's like not working uh, and like it's toxic or whatever like x else problem you could have uh yeah and you know also also sometimes like people just uh you know after many years in a in a company, you just you know uh, grow tired and like burn out and like you know mm. changing positions also very healthy, um, yeah. So yeah, I've kind of evolved on this. Like I was kind of like, uh, and I think like you know we talked about like size being a vanity metric. Another vanity metric is kind of employee retention. I mm. think uh, because you know the objective should not be just to retain blindly people. You know it should be like people should be happy, you know, they should grow, the company should grow. That's kind of the objective. The objective isn't just to keep people for, for like keeping them safe. Uh, yeah. I agree. I agree. And um, how, how did you manage, like, for example, like the, um, I would say, let's say you have promoted someone to a heads of position or like C levels, etc., and you realize that they're not a good fit in that position, but you know, like they're still a good fit for the company because they've been there for a long run. Like, how exactly do you, like, uh, deal with this type of situation? I mean, I think something that, that like, at least for me, like, I think there's a different strategy you can use. You can, you know, be ruthless and just say, okay, you know, off the bus with the person, you know, let's go and hire somebody else or whatever. Uh, 
But you know, for me, it, it is always like trying to find another position for them if they have appetite for that. Uh, of course, like you need to be very upfront that like things are not working out. You know, like uh, there needs to be feedback and like be, you can't just do that like you know out of the blue. Mm. Like there needs to be some context why you're doing that. And honestly, like I think, uh, like when you have people that are struggling, they know they are struggling. You know, and yeah. you're actually ma- making them a favor. So like you know, being upfront and telling them, okay, you know, this isn't really working out. So we can try to find you a new position, you know, or, uh, you know, you can try just like leave, uh, you know, and we will support you on that. We'll try to find you a new home. Uh, you know, that's kind of like the, the, the attitude I have is kind of like trying to transition them into something that can help them out and not just saying, okay, you know, you're fired and then yeah. bye-bye. Like, uh, especially, you know, for people that have been there, for a long time they've like contributed a ton i think like you own them like uh like a, a way forward that, that 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 they are also okay with yeah of course and um you mentioned that uh your team is right now like around 100 people uh 100 remote how exactly like uh do you manage such a big team being like fully remote um what's what would be like for you the i would say three to four key things that a remote company needs to do for things to be working properly? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, like uh, I and like we as a company have been super like opinionated about this uh, because something like we figure out like um, like maybe around, I don't know, 2015, 14, uh, like we were some of the early adopters on Slack. Uh, mm. And we what we figure out is like real-time communication, like sync communication, meetings all the time like it doesn't really scale uh you know it doesn't really work it doesn't really produce great results uh it's kind of toxic like you know uh, especially as like fully distributed company because you can work all the time and as a leader you know you will be pinged all the time like you can't really disconnect uh, so like we were super burned out by this uh and that's where we kind of figure out like you need to move more into like asynchronous you know like you need to have delayed communication where actually people can control like when they want to communicate when they would don't want to communicate you know um and this has been like a superpower and we have kind of tried to promote this and we see like there's kind of like a asynchronous movement booming like there was like remote first like was also like a you know like a, a like a super niche thing like 10 yeah. years ago <laughs> and asynchronous first is the same thing where you know uh people are kind of like figuring this out that like if you actually want to do remote properly and fully distributed properly you you can't really do like you know zoom calls and slack chat all day long uh yeah so for you basically like the inconvenience of uh, slack or uh, real-time communication is just you know getting yourself being uh, disturbed every like single minute or getting like ping notifications so you can't do any deep work is that correct exactly exactly so Uh, and especially, you know, in a company like this, like most of our people are creatives, you know, like mm. they really need to like deeply think, deeply concentrate and stuff. Uh, so we are really trying, you know, like I think Paul Graham has like this article, like uh, makers versus managers schedule. And we are really like optimizing all in for like the makers, you know, like optimizing it for them and not for the managers, you know. Uh, yeah. So do do you like uh, split your company into like uh, departments and then you have one head of who's managing like the entire department or do you create like squads? Like how is the global organization? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, like we do many crazy things at least. <laughs> like uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the things we're also innovating on is kind of like how we structure work. Um, so we do have like department heads, like we have a head of design that has like, you know, like product designers, illustrators underneath them, like Anna. Uh, uh, but then the way that, so we actually have like these, you know, departments like iOS, uh, Android, uh, that have like bigger, like groups underneath them. But then like the way that we actually do the, like execute a project, for instance, like recently we have ex- executed task details view, which is kind of updating the task view uh, on Todoist. Uh, this is kind of like a small squad composed of like, you know, iOS, iOS engineer, Android engineer, 
a product designer, maybe a support person, marketing person. So they have a small squad where they execute like a small project and then they do it from end to end. Nice. Uh, Yeah. So we have actually a mix of both things. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And the thing is like, we are still iterating on this. Like we call the whole system, like the do system. And honestly, like we are still kind of in the early stages, but I think we're onto something because honestly, like this is something that like everybody I talk with is kind of struggling with. Like there's like no like great way of, you know, uh, like having workflows and like plan and execute stuff. And every, everybody's just like doing it like, you know, wild, wild west. And like they read how Google does it or Spotify, and then they implement something like ridiculous, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think there's like a huge room for improvement on this and just like innovating and trying stuff and seeing where it goes. Yeah. Nice. And um, for you, like when it comes to remote work, and uh, a lot of people are, I think it's, it has been evolving a bit with, uh, with COVID and people like working more remotely. But one thing that comes often are like two different things. For some people, it seems that uh, remote, you know, is not always a fit because they need to be like, uh, you know, with others. They need to be like in, uh, in spaces, etc. And for others, sometimes it's just, uh, and for some CEOs, they feel like remote work, you know, is... Uh, is a way where you can't really like control the productivity of people, et cetera, et cetera. Like, uh, what's, what's kind of like your view on it? Have you like implemented things based on OKRs or things like that? So people can, uh, so you can basically like evaluate people on performance rather than just like how we're spent and things like that. Like what's your, uh, point of view or management style when it comes to that? Yeah. I mean, I think like there's two things to unpack here is like, I think, you know, trust is kind of a big part of the system. You know, like you need to have deep trust in a remote first environment. Uh, so, you know, for instance, for us, like we don't really track anything regarding mm. people. Like we don't track how many hours they work. We don't track when they work, uh, where they work. You know, we don't really care. Uh, we really care about, you know, their output, like what they are actually delivering. Is that a great quality? Um so that's really, I think, like a key element. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of times you are really working with like super smart, super motivated people, you know. So uh, you really like, if you don't trust them, you know, they will just leave because they have a lot of, a lot of options. Like, you you know, <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants to get monitored, you know, like. Uh, uh, so that's, I think, one key element. Uh, and then like, how do we actually track and evaluate people and evaluate performance? Honestly, I think like it's super, super hard to do this, but something that's like critical for us and also like some other companies like Stripe are doing that is kind of like having managers that also are, are like functional experts. Mm. Uh, so we like are just to take Anna as well, like uh, our head of design, like she's an amazing designer, you know, if she looks at something like she can evaluate if it's you know good or not, you know, how much time, because like if you're an expert, you can actually judge you know, if you look at some design or some code, you can kind of judge like how how hard this problem is, you know. Uh, and that makes it much uh, easier to evaluate like, you know, great performer, uh, performance and like if people are struggling and et cetera. So I think that's the key is kind of like having functional experts at the helm. Uh, and even myself, you know, like, uh, you know, my background is like in engineering, but like I can also like look at design, like understand, you know, uh, product stuff. So like, Especially as a founder, I think it's also critical for you that you can actually elevate work in all kinds of areas. So you know, you know, what does great look like? You know, <laughs> if you don't, then like <laughs> you know, good luck like evaluating people because like you can't really do it by hour or like what they are saying or whatever. Like, you know, you need to look at the work that is being done. Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh it's good also to know like uh, the area where you're not an expert, but I think whenever you're starting, it's uh, it's important to do a bit of everything so at least you have a sense, you know, of uh, how good or how great someone can be. <laughs> and um I was uh, I was actually wondering when uh, you said something earlier regarding the fact that the great thing about asynchronous communication is that, you know, like people can choose whenever they want to be contacted or in touch, etc. Like, uh, does that mean that you guys don't do any meetings at all? Or do you also do like, a, I don't know, like weekly uh, company meeting or like, a, 
how exactly does that work? Because if you don't look where people are based uh, or time zone or things like that, it can be pretty like uh, hectic. How exactly do you uh, do you work uh, around that type of uh, problematics? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, there's actually a, a blog post that has been written by super organizers that's called the CEO with an empty calendar, which is basically me. <laughs> uh, so, so you know, like I probably have like a, a few meetings per day. Uh, most days it's just like one uh, or a few, you know, two. Uh, so like we do very few meetings and most of my you. meetings. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of superpower because... Mm. It means that you can kind of plan your day as you like. And honestly, like for me, it's also like it's not recharging to be in meetings all day long. Like it's really mm -hmm. like taxing on my like, you know, <laughs> just mm -hmm. happiness and like energy <laughs> levels. Uh, uh, yeah. This said, you know, I do think uh, like meetings are useful. Like some meetings are useful and also like are needed. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, like one on ones, like I never do one on ones in text. Like I always do them you know, uh, via a meeting because you just, you know, you can uh, read cues much easier. It's also just great to connect with people. So that's one aspect. And I think it's also like, it's critical for remote teams to meet as well in person. So like we do retreats yearly. Uh, each team also does their own retreat, mini retreat. Uh, so I think it's like meeting people, you know, getting, you know, a beer, like so eating some food, super critical, you know. Uh, so Like even as an asynchronous first, like it doesn't mean asynchronous only, you know, you can still, you know, have some useful meetings and like meet people in person. So that's at least like my stance on it. Uh, yeah. And the thing is like, we also try to be asynchronous only, like it doesn't really work, like, you know, because we are still humans, you know. Uh, so yeah, some aspect like, yeah, <laughs> like Def Punk said, you know, like a uh, human after all. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and in the end, so you don't do like uh, all hands meeting or like a meeting with like the full team, just like as a weekly thing where you update on the numbers, big project, etc. Like, not this is not. Uh... We have never done this. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's like something that that I'm going to try to do or that I want to do is kind of like do Loom like asynchronous mm. video. Yeah. I do like a blog post. And then like a video associated with that. We just like, you know, for instance, like we do like some priority, like half year priorities and just like status update them then, then and stuff like that. I think like that could make sense to do. But honestly, like I think like all hands meeting in a fully distributed company, it's super hard to scale, you know, like because mm. <laughs> yeah. you know, somebody <laughs> like need to like either do it very early or very late, you know. So yeah. <laughs> And um, I was curious, like, to go back a bit, you know, on all your learnings and in this, uh, you know, the bootstrap stories, we also try to, you know, share, like, the, the tough times. You've been working, you know, like, uh, on the Doist since 2007. Uh, so it's been uh, quite, uh, quite a long time. Has the growth always been up and to the right? Or did you face, like, a plateau at some point? And what were kind of, like, the, the biggest challenges when it comes to growing to where you're at right now, 20 million? Yeah, I mean, something you know, is like, I think you will always like, especially like if you do this like over a decade, like you will hit plateaus, uh, you know, where you're struggling. Mm. Um, and you will struggle like based on different aspects, you know, like some of it could be like growth, you know, you have growth problems, like growth is stalling. You need to figure out like new strategy, new stuff. Uh, but honestly, like, I think like something that is, we have struggled a lot of with is basically like, uh, for instance, like at some point we, we grew the company from like 20 people to 40 people. Mm. And then all hell like broke loose. Like we didn't really have like any support for like 40 people organization. Uh, so it was like, you know, we became actually much less productive. Like on 20 people, we were like super productive. You know, we were pushing stuff. Like things were just moving forward. Everybody knew what they were going to do, you know, like there was like a lot of connection. And then like 40 people, like everything just like stalled. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of like needed to like introduce new processes, like figure out, you know, like, okay, what are our core values? You know, like what is actually the thing we're trying to do, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, you know, that has been like a huge struggle, at least one of the struggles kind of like the process and like scaling structure uh, wise and grow it as well, like, you know, Yeah, uh, you know, I think like you see these like S curves, you know, uh, and yeah. I think like every every product follows them, and you need to figure out like you know what is your next X curve, 
uh, what are you going to invest in? And sometimes you also do investment that maybe doesn't really pan out as, as you think. And then you kind of like need to scramble and, and figure out. But honestly, like, I think that is also like the part of the excitement, I think, like, because honestly, it would be super boring if you just like up to the right. Like, you know, yeah. uh, of course, <laughs> you'll probably be, ah, like this. Is, but, you know, we are humans. Like, I think we really need to have like, uh, like uh, like some struggles because I think like it's really in the struggles where you maybe you know really build yourself, build your team, you know grow as a person, grow as a team. Because like in these, I mean I can tell you like from 2014 to maybe 2016, I think like we grew 200 percent year over year. Like it was just like you know like yeah wow like yeah this is amazing <laughs> exponential and, then, and... <laughs> uh, then it was just like dropping and i'm like fuck like you know like now you know let's figure out like what to do next you know um uh and i think like you hit these uh and you know at least for me it's like i think you can take this like different ways like you can see them as a challenge where you actually need to revise you know improve yourself improve your team grow and then you hit uh, another peak and then you need to go to the next level. That's at least how I look at it. It's kind of like, yeah, that makes it also like fun because I have been at this like for many years now and I still, you know, wake every day and like I'm, I'm super excited to work. So yeah, that's more challenges along the way. And uh, I love the way you were, you're looking at it. You know, it's like, uh, it's usually during this time that first, you know, like your team and yourself can really like grow to the next level. And, uh, and it feels great also like to have challenges and overcome them uh, as a team. Yeah. 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 I, I think a hundred percent. And I think like actually some of our problems, this has been maybe that we have had it like too easy, you know, like if mm. you really hit like product market fit, then, you know, you're just growing you don't really actually know why you're growing, you know, because you're just like kidding. You're being <laughs> it lucky, just works. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. like that really does not really set you up because at some point, like you hit challenges and where you actually need to understand, like, you know, the depth of it and like you need to improve mm. and grow, and etc. Yeah. And um, your market with uh, Todoist was um, mainly like SMBs, you would say, or... Uh... Yeah, I mean, right now it's kind of like prosumers, uh, actually. So, like, it's not even SMBs, it's more like prosumers. But actually, like, we are moving into, like, the SMB, like, collaborative space. Um, okay. Because, yeah, I mean, it's all something, like, you will learn. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, you know, some markets uh, just have, like, much better, like, uh, business models than others. So, for instance, like, uh, collaborative products, you know, uh, it's actually, so you have like two challenges, you know, there's many challenges. Honestly, I think like both things are super hard. Uh, in the single player mode, you know, you must build like a great product, but the problem is like, you don't really have expansion, uh, you know, because it's just like one person. Mm. You also usually have like high churn, uh, you know, because it's just like one person, you know, and they can easily just churn and use another product. Uh, so that's huge challenge. But on the team products, you know, you have like expansion revenue, uh, you know, retention is usually much better, but the problem there is really like kickstarting the network. Uh, so you have a whole different like challenge. So, you know, both things super challenging. And honestly, I think like, if you want my, like uh, the thing I have learned, like I have still not applied 100% inside to this, but like that's the next stage. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, if you combine like the single player mode and multiplayer mode, into one product i think that's kind of like where the magic happens yeah uh, and no i i think it's uh i think it's great and i agree that uh you know like churn can be challenging and we've seen it also uh for us you know with uh whenever you have like way smaller team or single user etc and uh, what have you done uh or has churn been something you know you were saying because whenever you don't have growth anymore it can be because two things one uh, you know, you have like no more users coming to your website, etc., which is rarely the case. And the other one can be just like your churn is too high and you hit that plateau. So whenever you have that plateau, you can either go after your churn and say, I want to reduce it as much as possible so I can get growth. Or I'm looking at, you know, like new growth levers or new acquisition channels so I can actually like uh, grow uh, even faster and 
fuck the churn, <laughs> you know? So what, has it been something, you know, like that, uh, that you decided to just go after and spend like, I don't know, a quarter, six months on trying to understand why people churn and, uh, and trying to reduce it as much as possible? Yeah, I mean, we have tried a lot of stuff, you know, uh, and what we have found out is like, there's no silver bullets, you know, mm. uh, like you may think like, you know, there's like some amazing thing you can do, uh, but there's like no silver bullets. Uh, so like, I think like a lot of times, like also churn, there's kind of like the, you know, like there's limits set by the product that you have. Uh, so for instance, like a true app, like to do this, like, I think there's limits of how low or high the churn can be, mm. you know, especially for like, if it's a single player, like, you know, a mode. Um, and regardless of what you do, you know, you can't really change because a part of it is kind of human nature. So I think like also something that's like, has been super useful for me is kind of like Lenny's uh, newsletter. I'm not sure if you mm, know it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, he has like amazing posts on like what good churn is and like being aware, you know, what market are you in? What is actually great look like in your market? And you'll be surprised. Like at least I was like, I thought like a, a churn was shit, you know? And then yeah. I looked, oh, like, we are pretty, actually pretty good. <laughs> because like, you know, it's just like, uh, it's just the market that you're in. Yeah. You know? Like you can't really do magic. Uh, so but what I think like it's also critical is kind of like, Okay, so you need to figure out what is good churn. Uh, where are you at on the scale? Can you actually improve it? Then you should do, do that. Or not, you should kind of look at, you know, can you find some other like, you know, like markets that are close by where like the churn is much better, you know, then, you know, you can go after that. And maybe that's a better investment than, than like trying to improve like the, you know, the minimal thing you can do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I feel like, uh, you know, that's actually like looking at benchmark. I know ProfitWell does that also, you know, per market or like per target, etc. It's a, it's a great way to see where you stand because again, like uh, like what you would see online from VCs are usually like uh, metrics, you know, for enterprise uh, who have like usually like super low churn, but super long sales cycle, etc. So it's uh, it's important to look at it as a, as a whole, as you said. And um, I'm I'm curious because we're gonna like almost coming to the end of the episode. Time flies. Um, to know like uh, as an entrepreneur, and you know like uh, in the in the past years, uh, from the day you started, if you had to do things a bit differently, or one or two things that you would do differently, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, I think something that you know is super critical that we should have done like much much earlier. It's kind of like define our mission. Uh, you know, uh, define our core values, you know, define what you actually stand for. What do you want to do in the world? You know, uh, I think we have been like way too late with this. Uh, so that's something I can deeply recommend. And also something that we started like the first iteration we did, like we had 14 core values, like nobody could really remember any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and you all really like, you know, could feel like core mm. values, like, yeah collaboration yeah like you know everybody yeah. wants to be good at collaboration you know that isn't with their relationships <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 uh so i think like you know being super opinionated like limiting that like we currently have only four core values nice. and some of them are kind of like opinionated you know like not everybody will fit into them and i think that's fine um yeah so that's something that i, I wish we had done much earlier yeah and um in order like uh, for us to kind of like wrap up uh, this episode, I usually ask uh, three questions. The first one is, uh, what book would you recommend for a bootstrap entrepreneur? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've actually thought about this, like, you know, what book? Uh, yeah, um, I think there's a lot of uh, great books, but honestly, like one of the best, it's actually Paul Graham's wife that has written this, like called Founders at Work. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if you know it, but it no. basically follows like different founders and their storylines. And like I read this like very early in my life, and I, I was really inspired by that. So ah, founders cool. at work, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely check it out. I love founder story. I think it's like the some another book I like really uh, about the founder story is the one from uh, Ren Fish, Renfishkin, Lost and Founder. 
I think it's really cool also, you know, you see the ups and downs and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one yeah, is really crazy. <laughs> Lots of drama. Um, and the second question I have is, uh, who is the one bootstrap entrepreneur uh, that you are following or who you find inspiring? Yeah, I mean, you know, some like so there are some storylines, and again, like very early on, like I read the story of like uh, the Patagonia founder. I'm actually unsure it's a French name. Yes, <laughs> I'm not a French <laughs> Let's not try it. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's not try it. <laughs> I don't want to. I mean, he's an old dude right now, but like uh, he's an amazing uh, founder, and you know what he has done like with Patagonia has been incredible. And actually, has a really cool book called uh, "Let My uh, Let My People Go Surfing." Mm, okay. um, that is like really, really inspiring, and like kind of like sets his like philosophy of how he has built like the culture, the company. Um, yeah, so you know that's really something that that I wish you know this can also become this kind of like an inspiring company that kind of has a deeper mission, and you know where you also empower people, and yeah. So let my people go surfing, you know, and that storyline, <laughs> yeah, he himself, like mm. he's amazing. Yeah. Nice. So yeah, like some of the stuff that he does is basically like he actually, I'm actually unsure if he does it still, but like he did like yearly trips to Patagonia in Chile, where he would just like go kayaking and like he would just like leave for months. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I must people like would if, wonder whether or not the guy is dead, you know, like, do we uh, still yeah. have a CEO? <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, uh, that is very inspiring. I, I don't think like, I will ever do that. You want to no. disappear in Patagonia? Is that the message? Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. And the final question is, what the one thing you do uh, to regain energy during tough times? Yeah, I mean, something that I do a lot and I have done like a lot is like play uh, football. I kind of like, as I got older, I kind of have, my knee has kind of like deteriorated, so I can't really do that. But like sports for me, it's kind of like, actually the only thing, or like one of the only things where like my brain can shut off, you know. Uh, so especially like during football, because like it's so intense, it's a team sport, you need to be present, you know. You can't just like go and think, uh That's where really I really like, you know, uh, like kind of regain my, my energy uh, and like also release some stress and stuff like that. So for me, like sports, that's really, really critical. And yeah, so something as well as as you get older, like, uh, you know, and the body kind of starts to fall <laughs> apart. <laughs> uh, I've tried to find like new sports. I've tried like to swim. But the thing is, like, I really like, like I want to like it needs to be a game you know it needs to be mm. intense yeah so yeah I, I'm, i'm trying to get into like paddle right now okay it's like much easier to for knees and yeah. yeah but it's still yeah i'm still kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah learning it and uh, but yeah so yeah sports that's cool that's cool and um where can uh, people follow you or follow your journey or check out like uh, what you're up to yeah i think like twitter is the best thing Uh, it's like I'm on Amix 3K, uh, and yeah, I I tweet actually quite often. Uh, yeah, so that's the best way to to follow me. Yeah. Awesome. We'll put the link in the in the show notes. Well, Amir, thanks a lot for uh, joining us on the Bootstrap Story, and uh, have an amazing day. Gee, thank you. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to more stories. You know, we are building something. Uh, I think like very valuable uh, in terms of, like Bootstrap and like you know sharing the You know, some tips and stuff like that. And of course, like people are also just like welcome to message me as well. Uh, uh, you know, if they have any questions and stuff. So yeah, thank you for having me. It was super fun. And yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Samir. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Stories, the only podcast where bootstrap entrepreneurs share their journey in all transparency. If you enjoyed this episode, don't hesitate to leave us a review. And in case you want to see the interview, all episodes are live on the YouTube channel. Check out the link in the description and hit subscribe if you haven't already. Have an amazing day and make sure to also join us in our amazing Bootstrap community where we all helped each other to become successful and grow a profitable business. Take care and talk to you soon.